This hearing of the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming is called to order. Uh, during the last two weeks, delegates from more than 180 nations, including the United States, met in Bali, Indonesia, to begin the process of developing a post-2012 worldwide agreement to reduce global warming pollution. This past Saturday, these delegates adopted the Bali Action Plan, which puts in place a roadmap for negotiations over the next two years. This roadmap has been criticized for being too weak, too fuzzy, and inadequate for leading us out of the climate wilderness. Today's hearing will shine a light on the Bali Agreement and give us a sense of whether we are headed towards climate catastrophe or climate responsibility. The Bali Action Plan rests on four key pillars of climate policy. Reduction of global warming pollution, adaptation to global warming impacts, technology development and transfer to developing countries, and financial investment to aid developing countries. This roadmap appears to represent real progress in a number of key areas. Most importantly, it marks the first time that developing countries have agreed to consider taking actions to reduce their global warming pollution. The roadmap also increases the focus on adapting to the impacts of global warming that the world can no longer avoid. It recognizes the need to develop and deploy clean technology and steer global investment towards low carbon ventures, as well as the importance of avoiding uh, tropical deforestation in combating global warming. The Bali Action Plan achieved these important steps uh, for forward despite being weakened by the continued opposition of the Bush administration. Initial drafts of the roadmap included language based on the latest science that recognized the need for global heat trapping emissions to peak within the next 10 to 15 years before declining by more than half by 2050, with developing countries reducing emissions 25 to 40 percent below 1990 uh, by uh, 2020. In the face of opposition from Bush administration negotiators, backed by Japan, Russia and Canada, this language was dropped from the final action plan. These science-based guides to emission targets were relegated from front and center to a footnote in the final document. Although inclusion of these guides uh, would have strengthened the roadmap, the leaders gathered at Bali did succeed in opening the door to negotiations on a new global agreement. These negotiations represent an opportunity to address global warming comprehensively. But we still need gl global leadership to realize this opportunity. One message that emerged from the world's leaders in Bali is that we cannot afford to wait any longer to take international action to address global warming. The question now is whether the Bush administration will continue to be a roadblock on this new path. In the meantime, Congress has taken the critical first step to reduce our global warming pollution by passing a democratic energy bill which President Bush signed today. That raises the fuel economy standards of our vehicles for the first time in over 30 years and puts our national energy policy back on track. The energy bill is an important down payment on solving the climate crisis, reducing U.S. global warming emissions by up to a quarter of what is needed to save the planet by 2030. In the new year, Congress will begin work on a cap, auction and trade bill which will achieve the balance of the reductions needed and demonstrate the U.S. leadership that is essential to reach a global agreement under which all countries take action. We are fortunate to have an outstanding panel of experts on, U on the U.N. climate negotiations with us today. Many of our witnesses were in Bali participating in the negotiations and have graciously agreed to join us so soon after returning. I look forward to hearing all of your thoughts on the outcome of the Bali conference and the next steps for international climate negotiations. I would now like to recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last week in Bali, Indonesia, a speaker at the UN Climate Change Conference had some pointed comments about what must happen in order to achieve a meaningful agreement on global warming. The speaker had firsthand knowledge of the political landscape in the United States. The speaker said that international negotiators had to move away from failures that have hampered global warming talks since the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change had its first meeting in Berlin 
12 years ago in 1995. The speaker, referring to the so-called Berlin Mandate, said that the meeting put in place an inadequate process that exempted China, India, and other developing nations from taking significant steps to reduce emissions. By exempting these nations, the Speaker said, it made the subsequent Kyoto Treaty impossible to ratify in the United States Senate. The Speaker warned that negotiators in Bali must not make the same mistake of exempting China and India and other developing nations. The Speaker said that many in the United States were ready to move forward with substantial greenhouse gas reductions, but not, and I quote, without the knowledge that other folks are cutting in a way that's meaningful, unquote. The Speaker wisely said that technology transfer and assistance with developing countries is crucial. To quote the Speaker again, quote, the industrial world can't do it alone, unquote. And while that speaker at Bali and I disagree on many global warming policy proposals, I am pleased that my chairman's own junior senator, John Kerry of Massachusetts, grasped the importance of including China and India in the process. Senator Kerry's statements are a breath of cool, fresh air when compared to those of another American who spoke in Bali. While Senator Kerry laid out conditions that must be met in order for a global warming treaty to be approved by the United States Senate, another former presidential candidate simply laid blame for lack of promise at the feet of America. And while Vice President Al Gore was calling America the obstructionist at the Bali conference, he failed to notice that other nations were joining the United States in opposing the mandatory reduction targets in the Bali roadmap. Mr. Gore also failed to acknowledge that China and India initially refused to commit to taking actions on their own to reduce emissions before eventually accepting that they need to be part of the solution, too. And I'm very pleased that China and India agreed to language in the Bali Roadmap for, quote, nationally appropriate mitigation actions that must be measurable, reportable, and verifiable. While there are some provisions in the Bali Roadmap that raise concerns, I think overall it's a good agreement. Negotiators have given policymakers all over the world the time to promote the development of technology that will make emission restrictions achievable without damaging the economy and hurting jobs, and thus making those restrictions and changes politically untenable in any democratic country in the world. If China and India were willing to work with the international community, it's possible to develop a meaningful climate change treaty that creates real environmental benefits, protects jobs in the economy, and advances technology. Without China and India, any global warming treaty would simply be an invitation for manufacturers to move their operations to these unregulated economies. And where would our economy and environment be? I opposed the Kyoto Treaty from the start because I knew what we were getting into with that flawed agreement. And I am disappointed that there are those in this country that did not heed what Senator Kerry said then and what he said 10 years ago when the Bert Hagel resolution came up. And because those cautions were not heeded, the Senate didn't ratify the treaty and eventually we lost at least a decade and probably more in reaching an agreement that could be worldwide in application, was technology-based, and which would be politically acceptable both in this democracy as well as in other democracies around the world. I hope that this roadmap from Bali can start us on the path toward a more realistic and effective global emissions reduction solutions. But I must caution everybody that if we fall into the trap of what caused Kyoto to fail, then we will be losing even more time in this fight. I thank the gentleman and I yield back the balance of my time. Great. Fired and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm looking forward to this hearing today so that we can learn about what happened in Bali and what we do with that experience. The good news is that that will be the last international gathering of that scope where the United States is totally isolated 
from not just the rest of the developed world, but probably the rest of the world in total. Uh, and I count that as a singular uh, bright spot. Mm -hmm. But just because we've been isolated uh, does not mean that we haven't a great deal of leadership going on in this country. And I appreciate the reference to Al Gore, so derided by some as the ozone man, who has had a consistent message for years and is now recognized globally for being right and being effective in moving us in the right direction. We also have a great cross-section of people who have been involved with the leadership in this country. Uh, a slice of what is happening in terms of the NGOs, the private sector, unions, uh, over 750 cities, um, which I find extraordinarily exciting. There is still time for this Congress, uh, under the leadership of you, Mr. Chairman, and this committee and others, to be able to have signal accomplishments before we conclude. And I think the combination of what's happened in Bali, the international consensus, the leadership on the ground, means that it's much more likely that the focus of this election is going to mean that not only will we make some success in 2008, but the stage will be set for a new era of American policy. And I look forward to uh, starting to get a glimpse of some of these specifics as we listen to our witnesses here today. By the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you. I just want to, as far as when we talk the road, about the road from Bali, I just want to note that this is moving so fast, both in the wrong direction and the right direction, that we ought to have both concern and optimism. It's moving in the wrong direction because the science, as we know, is astoundingly rapid at giving us signals that things are going out there, particularly feedback mechanisms in the far north, that are 20 times disturbing as they were two or three years ago. The good news is, is that the people of this country are changing so rapidly on this issue and the science of the technology of dealing with energy solutions is this are becoming so available to us that we ought to have some optimism following Bali. And I just want to tell one little story why we ought to have optimism. Uh, about three years ago, I asked former Vice President Al Gore to address our colleagues about this issue. It was about three years ago. And it was in this building. And we ask all the members of the House of Representatives to come listen to him. Four members of the United States House of Representatives showed up to listen to the former Vice President of the United States. Now the world has given him the Nobel Peace Prize. <clears throat> and I encourage anyone who is interested in this subject to read his speech at Bali. It was, it was a work of genius. And it is, it is a mark not just of individual achievement, but a global action. And I just think we ought to come away from Bali with a sense of optimism to see how fast things are changing. And uh, with that, I will uh, yield back my time. The Chair recognizes Ms. Herseth Sandlin from South Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you ha for having this hearing. I want to thank all of our witnesses uh, for their participation in Bali and for being here today. I apologize I won't be able to stay for uh, the testimony, but I again wanted to thank you for taking the time to talk about uh, the next steps and the work of this select committee and the priority of the 110th Congress and continuing to make progress domestically as well as working with international partners in sharing information. And I would have to share, I, I want to reiterate the uh, statement made by Mr. Inslee about, you know, having some optimism. Uh, while there are going to be different interpretations uh, about the roadmap itself and how it compares to the objectives of the, co uh, of the conference, I do think that hopefully we can at least agree that the roadmap has us going in the right direction. We're not off course. Uh, we've made some progress in the last couple of years of at least acknowledging with what the science has provided and uh, the negotiations over the last uh, couple of weeks of the direction we need to go. Uh, but in the three and a half years that I've been in Congress, I've watched a dramatic shift on one area in particular, uh, as Mr. Inslee was describing, in terms of how fast things are changing, not only in terms of the science, but the political views that uh, people have about certain things where they may have had a certain position over the last 10 to 15 years and now all of a sudden are, are changing their positions, as my friend from New York, Mr. Elliot Engel, has done on the issue of biofuels. 
And so when we have gone from huge resistance to biofuels in some corners to a signing of a bill that has a 36 billion gallon target by 2022, addressing, as we will have to, some of the issues that will arise over the next few years, Again, we should have some optimism that we are going in the right direction, that there is more progress to be made, but we still haven't yet agreed on the pre precise destination we are trying to get to. But I have no doubt that uh, over the next uh, few months and certainly heading into the next uh, year or two that we will continue to make progress and we appreciate the strong efforts that all of you have made in getting us to the consensus that we have achieved thus far and the consensus that we hope to achieve in the months ahead. Um, so again, I, I thank you all for being here. We look forward to working with you uh, as we figure out the destination. Thank you. I yield back. Um, gentleman from Oregon is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I am going to waive my opening statement. Look forward to hearing the testimony of the witnesses. Chair, uh, recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Uh, I, too, would waive my opening comments. Uh, I am uh, extremely uh, interested in hearing from the panelists uh, on whether or not they view this uh, major economic uh, economies process as being competitive with the Kyoto Protocol or, or maybe more significantly uh, whether or not it is undermining uh, the Kyoto Protocol. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing, and I look forward to uh, hearing uh, more detailed uh, or de detailed responses from our witnesses. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to commend the members uh, who have participated in the Bali conference for their hard work and for their accomplishment. Uh, I, I recognize the challenges ahead. They are going to be uh, difficult. They are very uh, big. But I am very optimistic because both of the technology that I see already in play, uh, but also because we are opening up this cooperation is opening up a new chapter in human history. Uh, a chapter of cooperating worldwide to solve global problems. Uh, and so I look at this as a tremendous achievement. I thank the participants uh, and I yield back the balance of my time. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will be brief. I just want to welcome our panelists also and, and uh, watched with uh, much amusement at the behavior of the United States at the particular uh, meeting in Bali. I was very disappointed, very disappointed because so many of us here in the Congress have been working very hard on trying to educate our communities, especially communities of color, but more importantly, the messages that are sent out to, th to third world countries. And in particular, I am thinking about countries that have been hardest, hardest hit by droughts and fires and hurricanes. And I look uh, south of the border, I look to Latin America, and I see that uh, folks there are looking for leadership. And I know while we have the technology, we have the know-how, we have the financial resources, that we should be providing a bigger role. Uh, on a bigger level. So I am very anxious to hear what you have to say. Many of us here are excited. Um, I know my staff and I worked on getting an amendment uh, into the Appropriations Foreign Operations Spending Package that would require for the first time the Secretary of State to convene an interagency committee to provide Congress with a report describing the needs of developing countries and the actions plan to help provide for their needs. This is a, a major, major concern of ours here in the House, and I am happy to say that in spite of what the administration may say, those of us here as repre representatives for our constituents are strongly in support of advancing uh, whatever we need to do to make sure that our communities are, are uh, well taken care of and that we play an active role in combating the negative effects of uh, global warming in our, in, our, in our planet and in our country and in our neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Yield back the balance of my time. Great. The uh, gentlelady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York State, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for your work and for coming here to tell us about it. Uh, I am one who was raised to believe that the United States should be a leader in many spheres uh, of uh, government and policy, and this is one in particular that we should not uh, lag any further on. It's, we should not only join the rest of the world in uh, working for uh, reduction of greenhouse gases, but we should be leading. And I, of course, would love to see China and India also and all countries of the world join in, but I don't think we should hold back because uh, leaders do not hold back. They set the example for the rest of the world. Um, 
people in my district and the people I know around the country uh, who I speak to see the changes in the weather. They know about the drought in Georgia that's so extreme that, that boats and docks and marinas are far from where the water is. They know in our district about the 350 year floods in the last three years. Uh, they know about the ice storm in the, mid in the Midwest that was uh, deadly to many people. The 139 mile per hour hurricane force storm that hit the Northwest states. The typhoon that decimated Bangladesh. The multiple uh, extreme hurricanes that hit the Yucatan this year, uh, the tornado that destroyed the town of Greensburg, Kansas, uh, and on and on. These are phenomena that may be isolated, but are probably a part of the predicted pattern of increased intensity and frequency of storms. I have seen several examples recently of ways of developing and using energy. Just drove a hydrogen uh, car that GM is uh, uh, developing, which is especially if they get the hydrogen from water rather than from natural gas, I am optimistic that that is a possible solution to a uh, part of the problem. And of course, uh, the verdant hydrokinetic uh, tide power experiments that are going on in the East River in New York are very promising. Uh, the last thing I want to say, just because it is the Christmas time uh, or, or holiday time of giving for many people of many faiths, if you know somebody who has everything, and you want to give them something that will help mitigate the impacts of global warming, you can go on the Internet and search for uh, how to adopt a polar bear and give a polar bear to somebody who has everything. And that bear will be, uh, will be followed, their uh, habitat will be protected, and you can teach people at the same time about the changes going on uh, in the Arctic as a result of this problem. And uh, thank, with that, I yield back. And thanks for holding this hearing, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank you uh, very much. And, um, just before we ended, the general lady from uh, Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, has arrived, and she is recognized for an opening statement. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to all of our witnesses today. Uh, thank you for the hearing and the time. We all know that on December 15th, the UN completed a two-week conference in Bali, Indonesia, and it was attended by representatives of more than 180 countries. And the attendees completed the conference by establishing an Adaptation Fund Board to oversee the implementation of the Adaptation Fund created under the Kyoto Protocol. Delegates also considered policies to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation in developing countries. And however, I have two main concerns about the general path that the UN conference in Bali proposes. And these are concerns I want to address with you all today. First, the conference seeks to implement severe CO2 restrictions worldwide in an attempt to prevent global warming. And as we are hearing, global warming has little to do with human activities. So that one is of concern to me. Data is increasingly surfacing in peer-reviewed journals that show climate change may or may not be a problem. Further, much of the data and the climate models that the IPCC have used and some that the Valley Roadmap is based upon are appearing to pose questions and uh, the credibility is being questioned on those. Emerging data suggests that recent global warming over the past hundred years may not be caused by human CO2 emissions. Instead, the data tells us that the warming could be well within the natural variability and largely determined by changes in the sun. So that is one area that I would like to travel with you all. Second, the conference wants to institute a world carbon market to track and manage CO2 emissions. Last year, some of my colleagues and I went on a fact-finding mission to Europe uh, to look at their emissions trading scheme. I found it um, curious that they called it a scheme. And what we found was a system that maybe wasn't as credible as we would like to see it, uh, that it didn't reduce the CO2 emissions and in some cases might have even uh, aided the increase. So to force this type of system on every industrialized nation is not going to be something that's going to stop global warming. We have to look at what the benefits and the causes and the cost are going to be and then look at how we need to address other issues that may be more pressing problems that we can do something about, diseases, malnutrition and sanitation. 
So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Look forward to the questions and welcome to our witnesses. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, all time for opening statements by members of the committee have, uh, ex has expired. So we'll turn to our panel. And our first four witnesses today all participated in the Bali conference. We will begin with Mr. Alden Meyer, uh, Director of Strategy and Policy for the Union of Concerned Scientists. Mr. Meyer has, uh, for over 30 years, uh, had experience working on issues of energy and climate change, both at the state and national level. Before, becoming, before coming to the Union of Concerned Scientists in 1989, Mr. Meyer served as Executive Director for the League of Conservation Voters, Americans for the Environment, and the Environmental Action Foundation. We welcome you, Mr. Meyer. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey and members of the Select Committee. Uh, UCS has been active on international, national, and state climate change policy since 1989, and I have personally attended almost all of the international negotiating meetings on climate change since 1991, when negotiations started over the original Rio Framework Treaty. I am pleased to be able to share with you my observations on the Bali negotiations. I do believe this meeting reflected a sea change in the willingness of both developed and developing countries to move forward together in confronting the climate threat and really opens the way for serious negotiations over the next two years. Substantial scientific evidence indicates that an increase in the global average temperature of more than 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels would pose severe risks to natural systems and human health and well-being. Limiting warming to this level will require global emissions to peak within the next 10 to 15 years and then be reduced by 50 percent or more by mid-century, with much deeper cuts for industrialized countries. In the late 1990s, you may recall companies opposed to U.S. ratification of the Kyoto Protocol ran television commercials with the theme, it's not global and it won't work, because China, countries like China and India did not take on binding emission targets under the initial Kyoto framework. The most important outcome of Bali, in my mind, is the full recognition that the climate change pro problem is global and that we all have a stake in addressing it. In Bali, the world saw the dismantling of the so-called Berlin Wall the famous phrase in the 1995 Berlin Mandate that Mr. Sensenbrenner referred to that prohibited any new commitments for parties not included to Annex I of the Framework Convention, non-industrialized countries. The President of Indonesia captured it well in his key keynote address to the meeting. Developing countries, too, must do our part. The bottom line is that we all must do something differently and do something more. The new Australian Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, put it starkly. The community of nations must reach agreement. There is no plan B. There is no other planet any one of us can escape to. We have only this one, and none of us can do it alone, so let's get it right. And the minister from India captured the true spirit of Bali when he said, what is at stake is saving our future generations. And therefore, it is not a question of what you will commit or what I will commit. It is a question of what we will commit together to meet that challenge. Through the constructive efforts in Bali of countries like China, Brazil, Indonesia, South Africa, and others, Costa Rica, with the last-minute acquiescence of the U.S., negotiations have been launched under the Framework Convention on nationally appropriate mitigation actions by developing country parties, as well as on post-2012 emission reduction commitments for the U.S. and other non-Kyoto industrialized countries. Simultaneously, negotiations over deeper emission reduction obligations of industrialized countries that have ratified Kyoto, including most recently Australia, will continue in the ad hoc working group launched in 2005 in Montreal. These two negotiating tracks will proceed in parallel with comparability of action required for all developed countries. Consensus could not be reached on the level of ambition for these negotiations as the U.S. fought hard to keep any specific reference to the need for industrialized countries to reduce their emissions 25 to 40 percent below 1990 levels by 2020 out of the convention track decision. In the closed working group negotiations, developing countries said they could accept a reference to the need for global emissions to peak in the next 10 or 15 years and to be reduced by 50 percent or more by mid-century. This would have been a significant achievement given that achieving such a goal would require substantial reductions in projected emissions for big developing countries like China, India, and Brazil. But these countries made it crystal clear they could only support such a goal if it were to be accompanied by the language on 25 to 40 percent reductions in emissions by industrialized countries by 2020. The U.S. was unwilling to cut this deal, falsely claiming that inclusion of such a range would, quote, prejudge, unquote, the outcome of the negotiations. In my view, this was a significant missed opportunity. 
But the science-based language remains in the Kyoto Track decision, along with the comparability language in the Bali Action Plan. You, you, so you could argue by reference it applies to the United States. Well, the language on mitigation actions by developed and developing countries generated the most intense debate in Bali. There are a number of other important building blocks included in the Bali Action Plan, which I describe more fully in my prepared testimony. These include adaptation, as Ms. Solis referred to, helping vulnerable developing countries deal with the significant Im impacts of climate change that are already apparent and will only worsen in the future. Reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, which accounts for an estimated 20 percent of global CO2 emissions, equal to the total emissions of the U.S. or China, and more than the total emissions of the transportation sector worldwide. And strategies to facilitate the development, transfer, and accelerated deployment of clean technologies, along with greater access to financing and ca capacity building for developing countries. Putting flesh on the bones of the technology and financing elements of the Bali Action Plan is key to reaching agreement over the next two years on sectoral, policy-based, and other mitigation commitments by developing countries to help decarbonize their future development path. The fact that at the end of the day, the Bush administration was unwilling to block these negotiations from going forward is a hopeful sign. For while a different U.S. team will be on the field during the second half of the negotiations, it would have been a tragic waste of time to run out the clock. Finally, Mr. Chairman, in her speech during the high-level segment, Connie Hedegaard, the Minister of Denmark, which will host the meeting in December 2009, where the new agreement will hopefully be reached, laid out a clear challenge to the U.S. It is about time that we act in a collective, constructive, and timely manner. For almost a century, Europe has looked to the U.S. for leadership and guidance in times of instability and change. We do so yet again as we strive to reach a truly comprehensive agreement to combat climate change. But we do so knowing full well that all countries, not just the largest emitters, share responsibility for the final in outcome. I hope, Mr. Chairman, that we will heed Minister Hedegaard's wise words as we move forward from Bali to Copenhagen. Thank you, Mr. Meyer, very much. Our second witness um, is Mr. Phil Clapp, who is the Deputy Managing Director of the Pew Environmental Group. Mr. Clapp previously served as the President of the National Environmental Trust which he has led since its founding in 1994. Mr. Clapp has more than a decade of experience on Capitol Hill as staff director of the House Budget Committee's Energy and Environment Task Force and legislative director for former Senator Tim Worth. We welcome you, um, Mr. Clapp, whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> and thank you for your invitation to be here today. First of all, I want to congratulate you on uh, what's just occurred. The President has just signed the energy bill, and that culminates what I know is for you a 20-year crusade to increase the fuel economy standards um, in federal law. And you contributed an enormous amount to that all the way back to 1982, and I remember your efforts back on the Energy and Commerce Committee at that time. So congratulations. The delegates came to Bali with fundamentally three challenges. Oh. I'm sorry. So we said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a good strategy. Uh, <clears throat> Um, delegates came to Bali with fundamentally three challenges. First, a decision as to whether to launch formal negotiations on a new treaty uh, to be concluded in Copenhagen in, uh, in 2009. Secondly, to establish the timetable and rules for those negotiations. And third, to agree, to agree upon measures that would be open for discussion. Uh, that was the minimum bar, and I think all three were accomplished in Bali. We have an agreement today that could have launched a much stronger set of negotiations, uh, as many of you have noted in your, test in your uh, opening statements. Uh, the European Union proposed a reduction of 20 to 40 percent in worldwide emissions and a long-term goal of a 50 percent reduction by 2050. I want to emphasize that those were only in the preamble of the agreement. This was a ultimately hortatory statement that this is the target that the world should be seeking to reach in the new negotiations. No one was attempting in Bali to impose some sort of regulatory straitjacket uh, that said there was a binding agreement that these reductions should occur, but it was an attempt to create a budget. 
Unfortunately, the United States opposed uh, those provisions, that preambular language. And as a result, uh, although it does appear in the text, uh, we can claim less of an endorsement uh, coming out of Bali for that as a target uh, than we could have. And that's unfortunate. Given how quickly the scientific evidence is mounting, I mean, we are now at the point where Arctic sea ice was reduced to less than half of its normal size this year. The Northwest Passage opened for the first time in history this year. And we have scientists telling us very clearly um, most recently at the American Geophysical Union meeting that was held in San Francisco concurrent with the Bali talks, that we have reached the point when the Arctic may be free of summer sea ice not by 2040, a projection which shocked scientists when one uh, NASA scientist made it last year, but as early as 2012. The leading scientist who made that projection, who actually is the son of a coal miner and worked in coal mines as a, as a child, um, said the canary has died. It is time to get out of the mine. That's the urgency of these talks. The world has one more shot to get an agreement, and this will be it. There is enormous suspicion of the United States throughout these talks, and it does not come just from President Bush's opposition to, binding target, to a binding international treaty and numerical targets. The United States, all the way back to 1992, has a long history of either fighting binding, binding agreements, as it did with the Framework Convention under the first President Bush. That convention is voluntary only because of U.S. opposition. Through Kyoto in 1997, when the United States, under the Clinton administration, sought weaker targets and, indeed, did not act to reduce its own emissions. So we have an enormous challenge to lead. And Kevin Conrad of Papua New Guinea said it best at the end when he he said, lead, follower, get out of the way. We would like to see you lead, but if you will not lead, get out of the way. The United States has to lead these talks. There is enormous suspicious, which, suspicion of U.S. intentions under, either, under an administration of either party. And unless we do not take up our responsibilities, we will see another treaty that fails. I want to make one more comment about uh, the role of developing nations. Uh, which Ms. Figueres will go into, I'm sure, much more in much more detail. The watershed at these talks was that developing nations came to the table and the United States found itself incapable of saying yes to their proposals. For the first time, developing countries, including China, agreed to undertake measurable, reportable, and verifiable emissions reductions actions. That is a step across a line that was first drawn in 1992. In addition, although I was complimenting the chairman on the bill that was the president signed today, I'd like to point out that China, for example, has fuel economy standards in place today that met the same target in that bill, which is 2018, in 2005. So there's an enormous amount of leadership going on in the developed world that the United States is not recognizing. And unless we do and come to the table with something to offer in return for their leadership on a number of these issues, uh, we will find yet another failed negotiation. And I'll stop. Thank you, Mr. Clapp, uh, very much. <clears throat> and, uh, and thank you for your kind words about the uh, energy bill. Um, I might add that, um, that we have now finished the energy bill. The President has signed it. I don't think anyone was predicting that last December, but it has happened. And, uh, and what we're doing here in this December, uh, on this day, on this afternoon, is having the last hearing that this Congress will have. Um, but it's really the first hearing of the next Congress, uh, because there are a lot of people who do not believe that we can pass a cap and uh, auction and trade bill as well. But the Speaker is committed to it, uh, and that is why we're having this hearing today. Uh, think of it as the first hearing of, of the next big issue that we hope that we can get the President's signature on. Our next witness, uh, Christiana uh, Figueres. Uh, has been official negotiator of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Kyoto Protocol for Coast, Costa Rica uh, since 1995. She also serves as a member of the Executive Board of the Kyoto Protocol's Clean Development Mechanism. In 1995, uh, Ms. Uh, Figueres 
uh, founded the Center for Sustainable Development in the Americas, where she served as director um, until 2003. For her leadership in the areas of climate, energy, and conservation, National Geographic and Ford Motor Company recognized her with their Hero of the Planet Award in 2001. We are extremely fortunate to have her expertise on Costa Rica and developing nations. Uh, welcome, Ms. Figueres, whenever you are ready. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I did. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, honorable members. I speak to you as a citizen of Costa Rica, a developing country that has taken on the goal of being carbon neutral by the year 2021. We do so in full recognition that our impressive size will not necessarily affect global trajectories of emissions, but out of the deep conviction that it is the moral obligation of every country, large or small, to do the utmost to address climate change. You have asked me to come here today to address the issue of the Bali meetings from the perspective of the de developing countries. As already pointed out by speakers before me, this meeting will be recognized as the one meeting in which the developing countries made a landmark stride forward. I want to point out three specific issues that are highly unusual um, for developing countries. Number one their willingness to participate in the Climate Change Convention in very unusual ways. Developing countries are already and have already done more than the sum total of countries participating in the Kyoto Protocol, and I believe Ned will give you the numbers of that. However, in Bali, they express their very clear intent to do more than that. In a dramatic departure, from the traditional no new commitments stand, developing countries assumed under the Bali decision their willingness to undertake measures, me measurable, verifiable, and reportable actions supported by finance and technology on the part of developed countries. The industrialized countries assume measurable, verifiable, and reportable commitments or actions according to their national circumstances. From our perspective, we recognize that this is a major step forward for the United States, given where the United States has been over the last few years. But it is much weaker commitment than that which the European Union had already committed to before they went to Bali. So on that score, the developing countries have put much on the table, and as a group, the industrialized countries have put comparatively less. To my second point. Commitments, our very favorite word. The decision in Bali does not obligate any party to any type of commitment. In fact, it just opens a process over which, over the next two years, we will explore the form and level of commitment of all parties. The form of further contributions on the part of developing countries is yet to be determined, but it will very likely not be binding national emission targets as those that are assumed under the Kyoto Protocol. In fact, it is our task over the next two years to explore the full range of commitment types that may be possible and possibly to move toward a basket of commitment types where every country will assume the type of commitment that it feels comfortable with according to its national circumstances. Third and most importantly, contingency. The Bali discussions point very clearly to the fact that all further action of the, develop, of the developing countries is predicated on whatever the industrialized countries are going to do, and more specifically on what the United States is going to do. The United States is admittedly the largest historical emitter, the highest per capita emitter, and the wealthiest nation. It is understandable then that there is a perception that the United States is not doing enough. I would like to underline that a higher level of ambition of the United States as we go forward will encourage stronger contributions of the developing countries. Conversely, a lower level of ambition of the United States will elicit only weaker contributions of the developing countries. Hence, the United States is in the very privileged position of wielding the most influence on what the global overall level of effort is going to be as we move forward. To conclude, I would like to underscore 
that this new engagement of developing countries is a very clear invitation to the U.S. to engage. But there's a timing issue here. The agreement is scheduled to be reached by the end of 2009. Given where the United States is in its electoral cycle, it is more than likely that the U.S. participation in this regime will be shaped by this Congress. Hence, we are very encouraged by the development of mandatory legislation to reduce emissions in the United States. Honorable members, it is in your hands to ensure that we together live up to the science of what is needed and stay within the art of what is possible. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. And our next witness, Ned Helm, is a founder and president uh, of the Center for Clean Air Policy and has more than 25 years of experience working on climate change and air policy. Mr. Helm advises Congress, state governments and, Euro and the European Commission and developing countries on those issues. He played a key role in, in the development of the Clean Air uh, Act of 1990 and the European Union's emission trading system. So we welcome you, sir, whenever you are ready. please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members. Appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm kind of a cleanup hitter here, and I'll try to cover the points that maybe weren't covered by my colleagues. Uh, as you mentioned, we work a lot with key developing countries, China, India, Brazil, and Mexico in particular, and we work with a number of the states in the United States. During the course of the Bali meeting, we brought together ministers from 25 countries. Cristiano was part of that uh, meeting and talked about the Bali roadmap and the idea of providing incentives for developing countries to go beyond what they have done. And I'll show you in a minute uh, a slide that shows exactly how much effort they've made. And it was endorsed by all of those presidents and certainly became a part of the final agreement. We also hosted a meeting for Senator Kerry and your staff and other staffs there with the leadership of the European Union, a very constructive exchange on a, a lot of these issues. I want to make four points this morning. First, I want to emphasize the difference in vision between the United States and that of the European Union and developing countries and the rest of the world in this debate. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about the EU's leadership. I think what they did going into Bali and what they did at Bali was critical to the outcome and deserves a lot of recognition and, and reflects dealing with the competitiveness issue in an effective way, and I want to come back to that. Thirdly, I want to echo what Christiana and others have said about the role of developing countries and sort of provide you with some actual detail on the level of effort developing countries have undertaken already and what we expect coming forward. And finally, I want to address the issue that Mr. Sensenbrenner raised earlier about competitiveness. I think uh, the European Union has crafted a much better path, a much more positive path to dealing with that than we have so far in the U.S. where the major effort so far has been this border tax adjustments provision proposed by Mr. Bingham and others in the Senate bill. Uh, I think there's a much better path that developing countries would welcome that would move the ball forward rather than sort of saber rattling as we saw the administration do a bit of during the debate. Okay, let me hit quickly these uh, points. Uh, in terms of difference in vision, uh, I think the fundamental difference here is Europe and developing countries see this as a process where we take unilateral action, we step forward, make commitments, and then we work together through incentives to go beyond that. That it's a joint effort. We've all got to rise together to meet this challenge. In contrast, the U.S.'s view has been let's all make pledges, let's have some weak aspirational goals for 2050, and, and call it a day. I mean, the heart of the difference here is do we do something in 2020 that ensures that we still have the possibility of meeting the goal we want in 2050, or do we sort of see what happens and hope for the best? Basically, unless we make a decision in 2020 that's pretty concrete, we, we, force, we basically wipe out our chance of meeting the budget in 2050. In terms of EU leadership, uh, as you know, the, the heads of state of, of Europe back in March agreed to a 20 percent reduction below 1990 levels on their own unilaterally regardless of what anybody else does and they propose to do 30 percent or more below 1990 if other developed countries step forward and if major developing countries made comparable efforts and that really set the bar for the discussion at Bali it was a very useful signal and it also sent the signal that the EU sees this as not just a question of narrow competitiveness concerns, but matter, this is a bigger deal than that, that we can take a hit in the cement industry, the steel industry in the short run in return for solving this much larger problem. I think that's the way we got to think about this issue. In terms of developing country leadership, let me ask the team to put the slide up for me. Uh, I think this is a statement by the minister from South Africa, and I think it really captures where we are. He said, basically, developing countries are saying voluntarily that we're willing to commit ourselves to measurable, verifiable mitigation action. 
And then he said, it's never happened before. A year ago, this was totally unthinkable. This is what he said right before the U.S. caved. And I think this gives you a context of how much of a watershed, how much of a breakthrough this was. Next slide, please. Oh, I haven't? Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> this shows you quickly the numbers. Uh, as Christiana mentioned, the gray, gray line is what Lieber and Warner would do in 2015. The blue line is what the EU's minus 30 percent target would do. The red line is what China, Brazil, and Mexico, with laws on the books today in each of these countries, policies on the books today, if fully implemented, they would make greater total reductions from their business as usual levels than the European Union or the Lieberman Warner Bill. So this puts to sleep once and for all this myth about developing countries aren't doing anything, so we shouldn't do anything. Here, here are the facts, and as others have said, this is about car standards, this is about a 20 percent improvement in energy efficiency by 2010. This is by 2010. The Lieberman Warner numbers are for 2015 and 2020. So it gives you a sense of how big this is. I was in China the last two days, discussions with them, I was impressed by how committed they are. A lot of criticism has been, oh, they only got 1 percent the first year. This year, they'll get 4 percent of that 20 percent goal, and they're making big steps to go further in the, in the coming years. Let me close with a quick word on competitiveness. I'll come back to it hopefully in the questions. Uh, Europe has a high-level group on competitiveness. They brought together 500 chief executives. I got to speak there week before Bali. All the leadership of the European Commission, Secretary of Commerce, Secretary of Tre Treasury, Secretary of Transportation, and Commissioner of Environment, all met. They agreed on a package on competitiveness that says sectoral approaches make sense. Let's offer carrots to developing countries to take a similar carbon per ton of spent, carbon per ton of steel goal, offer some incentives in terms of financing, and we get toward that proverbial level playing field that we hear so much about, that Mr. Sensenbrenner was talking about. This is a much better path an incentive-based approach than this idea of putting uh, border tax adjustments on everybody. And Europe talks about border tax adjustments, too. The companies are just as worried there as we are here about what happens to our, our industries. But I think they recognize that there's a much better way forward, and this is something that I'd really like to see us do. The U.S. and the, uh, the Asia-Pacific Partnership started this thing, but as usual, they let it die by being unwilling to do anything serious. It's a classic story of everything we touch turns to you know what. That's what's happened in terms of the U.S. position. So uh, I think there's an opportunity here. There's an opportunity across the aisle here uh, to deal with this issue, and we really got to grab that piece. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helm. Energy bill step one, <laughs> mandatory <laughs> cap auction and Absolutely. trade. Absolutely. Our next uh, uh, witness um, uh, is uh, uh, Is uh, uh, Myron Ebel. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ebel is Director of Energy and Global Warming Policy at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Before joining the Competitive Enterprise Institute, Mr. Ebel focused on environmental issues as Policy Director for Frontier of Freedom, as a senior legislative uh, uh, aide for our good friend and colleague on this committee, Congressman John Shattig, and has also served as the Washington Representative of the American Land Rights Association. We welcome you, Mr. Ebel. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Uh, thank you, Chairman Markey, and, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I am sorry to say I cannot begin by congratulating you on the anti-energy bill that was enacted. Um, uh, one of the reasons I, I was not able to go to Bali this year is that you all have been keeping us so busy and uh, uh, with, with things that we oppose. Uh, but um, I do. But, but congratulations for getting it through. I'm not pleased, but congratulations, I, Mr. Ebel. I did not go, but I went by Avatar to right. uh, Bali. Right. I recommend right. that the next right. time. You well, I, I, I've been to many of these cops. Uh, you know, the uh, it's interesting that uh, 15,000 people were so eager to get out of our winter temperatures and fly to a tropical paradise. Um, um, uh, of course, they, they used a bit of energy. I don't hold that against them. Um, I would also like to say I'm very pleased that two members from my native state are here. Uh, one of them I consider my own congressman. Uh, he's from the right side of the Cascades, as I like to think of it. Um, um, I, I would like to say if I think that the, the Bali talks need to put it, be put in some kind of context. And, and what I would like to say is that if global warming is a problem, uh, then the Kyoto approach cannot possibly be part of the solution. Um, it's, it is being tried half-heartedly in some of the countries that ratified the Kyoto Protocol, and it's not working. Uh, the, 
even in the European Union, where global warming is a religious commitment, um, emissions are going up. Emissions have been going up since Kyoto was ratified in 1997. Um, they are continuing to go up. They are going up much more rapidly in some European nations than in the United States, uh, even though those nations have lower economic growth and, and virtually no population growth. Our emissions have uh, tracked population growth, uh, and we have been putting on about uh, one point of emissions growth for every point of population growth, and we've been putting on about three points of economic growth for every point of emissions growth. Uh, Spain has been putting on more than one point of emissions growth for every point of economic growth, for example. Now, if Europe were really serious about this issue, I think, I think there would be some indicators. For example, if the Brown government decides not to go ahead with the, the new runway at Heathrow, or if they decide to cancel the uh, proposed coal-fired power plants, or if the German government decides to back down on uh, auto emissions controls uh, and, and tells that their big automakers will just have to stop producing so many big cars. I think that would be an indication that they're serious. Uh, but, you know, we've got this uh, cap and trade before the Congress. Cap and trade is not working in Europe except to benefit big special interests. Uh, places like hospitals are having to buy credits from big oil companies, for example. Uh, this is a huge wealth transfer, but it is not an emissions reduction program. And I've uh, uh, brought copies of a paper, an exhaustive paper, uh, by a, a think tank in London, Open Europe, that uh, shows why the uh, European emissions trading scheme is not working. I would point out that the preface to that large paper is by a Green Party member of the Swedish Parliament. Now, I, I generally agree with Ms. Mr. Sensenbrenner uh, about Bali. I think there are reasons to be positive. And I would say, uh, first of all, the U.S. tends to be isolated at all of these uh, negotiations on multilateral environmental uh, agreements. And the reason is because we are unusual in that if we ratify a treaty, it has the force of law and it can be enforced in federal courts against the administration and against the Congress. That isn't true of any other country in the world. That's why if Japan or Canada or the European Union fail to meet their Kyoto targets, they'll say, oh, well, we tried. We're, we're, we're morally superior because our intentions were good. That would not be possible if we ratified the Kyoto Protocol or a succeeding agreement. We'd have to do what we said. It could be enforced in federal courts. But I do not think the U.S. is isolated anymore at this, these negotiations. I think it's the European Union that's isolated. The United States now leads, uh, and you will see this if you look at the positions of Japan, Canada, Australia even, even the new government in Australia, Russia, many of the G77 members, and I think uh, we have uh, found a lot of common ground with China and India. Very briefly, the common ground is mandatory regulations won't work if the technology and the economics don't work. Uh, that, therefore, future agreements must first focus on technology, on adaptation, and on some side issues uh, which I think are important, like forestry. Uh, so um, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ebell, very much. The Chair will now recognize himself for a round of questions. And uh, bless you, Mr. Clapp, and you, Mr. Meyer. Do you think that the major economies meetings initiated by the United States can make any positive contribution to the UN negotiating process? Are they more likely to undermine it? I think what is important, Mr. Chairman, is that the administration's objectives in the major emitters' talks are quite unclear. Uh, we have uh, two sets of talks going on here simultaneously. I mean, there is an aggressive agenda that has to be followed to achieve an agreement in Copenhagen under the uh, UN process by 2009. At the beginning of the Bali conference, the Chairman of the, on, of the White House Council on, on Environmental Quality delivered a letter to the other delegates outlining a process of monthly meetings between now and July. Uh, all over the world with an agenda to come to some sort of agreement by a leaders' summit in July. Well, every country only has so many global warming negotiators. Uh, 
Um, it's very unclear to me, and I think the administration should uh, should make clear what its objectives are, because it has the prospect of really undercutting the ability to con continue the U.N. negotiations. Meyer. Let me just build on that. I'm, I think the, uh, it, it could be a useful process if the U.S. would put forward a specific proposal of what we want to do. The European Union has said that they want to try to stay below the 2 degree Celsius temperature increase that I mentioned. Japan has put forward its Cool Earth 50, calling for a 50 percent reduction in global emissions by 2050. The U.S. refuses to put any specific proposal on the table. And I asked uh, uh, Jim Conant about this in, in Bali. I said it's like uh, inviting people to a dinner party and not serving food. Uh, the main purpose of the September meeting was to talk about the global long-term goal. The U.S. put no proposal on the table. If they don't put a serious proposal on the table in Honolulu, my own view is it's not a serious effort. Uh, if not two degrees, what? What risk are we willing to take with the planet? What risk are we willing to commit future generations to? Is it three degrees, four degrees, ten degrees? We don't know. The administration refuses to put forward a concrete proposal either for long-term global reductions or for near-term industrialized country targets. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Um, Mr. E. Bell, in your testimony, you say that global warming may be a problem in the future, but we should leave it to future generations to deal with it because they will be better equipped to do so. Do you reject the IPCC's conclusion endorsed in the Bali Roadmap that climate change represents an urgent problem and that continued delay will foreclose options to save the planet? Um, that's, that's an involved question, but I would say uh, it, generally yes. Uh, I think that if you look at You do reject those Yes. If you look at the, the most extreme scenarios from the IPCC computer projections, you will find that uh, even under what is called the A1FI uh, 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 scenario, uh, in 2100, the, the high growth, high emission scenario leads to a richer and warmer world uh, rather than a poorer and cooler world under the, some of the emissions uh, uh, constrained scenarios. So I, I think, in fact, uh, uh, to, to give you another example, uh, cold weather kills uh, an, a lot more people than warm weather, about uh, over 10 times more people die from cold weather every year than warm weather. Now, we know that uh, under global warming theory, most of the warming will occur in the upper latitudes in the winter, and all the projections from, from all of these models are uh, exactly, they, they mirror what has been happening in the 20th century, namely, as hot weather mortality has been going down, but cold weather mortality has not been going down nearly Thank as you, much. Mr. So from a s simple Thank utilitarian calculation, a little bit of warming in the upper latitudes will will lead to an, an increase in, in human uh, uh, flourishing. Let me go to uh, Ms. Figueres. Uh, your testimony discusses the watershed decision of developing countries at Bali to agree to consider mitigation actions under a new global climate change agreement. Given the current administration's intransigence on climate change, what explains developing countries' willingness to open up to this discussion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The willingness comes, I believe, from desperation. The fact that the United States has been completely unwilling to live up to its very visible responsibility has led developing countries to say, okay, then that means that we need to accelerate the pace at which we will accept our responsibility in order to bring the United States on board. Um, and I think really this is a very, very frank invitation to bring the United States on board. And if I could just add one comment to your question previously about the MEM. Um, from the developing country perspective, I think one of the major issues and arguments that has been said by the United States is that they needed a parallel process because the developing countries were not willing to play fairly within the climate regime. Bali has proved that that is no longer a valid argument. Thank you. Thank you. My uh, time has expired. The Chair will recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you know, I am kind of more of a veteran of uh, the climate change wars than any of my colleagues that are sitting here on the dais. Uh, and I hearken back to what Senator Kerry said at Bali, uh, and that is, is that any treaty that does not involve the third world uh, 
is doomed to failure in the United States Senate. Uh, I think that is a given. That is a political fact of life. And I salute Senator Kerry as a leading Democrat in making that observation to delegates who might not have wanted to have heard that message. Now, you know, that being said, uh, I guess I'd like to ask the, the panelists to briefly say, are we, as a result of Bali and the softening of the administration's position, the signing up of the developing countries, and particularly China and India, do you think we're going to hear less demagoguery from the European Union uh, on this subject? Because uh, what the EU has been saying, and particularly what the German Environment Minister, Herr Gabriel, has been saying, uh, certainly is not going to bring about the type of consensus needed to wrap this up in two years. Who'd like to be first? Mr. Helm. Uh, my sense is that. Uh we really saw a coming together of the EU with the developing world and most of the other nations in agreement on how to move forward. And I think, said my testimony, the EU is putting these targets out, set a bar that was very useful. And I think okay, now let me interrupt you sure. on that. Okay. Uh, the deal that was made in Berlin, which exempted the developing world and gave the EU a much lower emissions reduction target, the so-called EU bubble, uh, as a result of two factors that occurred since 1990 that had nothing to do with this issue. Basically, uh, was a deal where the developing world didn't have to do anything, and the EU was able to what we refer to in this business as pose for holy pictures and playing a game of economic gotcha against the U.S. and Japan and Russia uh, and perhaps some smaller countries like Australia and Norway as well. Now, if we're going to continue playing the game of economic gotcha, uh, you're not going to see very much support in the United States Senate for what proceeds uh, henceforth. And, you know, I think that what I am interested in seeing is whether the EU will admit not only that Kyoto was a failure, but the mistake that made Kyoto a failure was the agreement that came from Berlin in 1995. I think there's two, two responses. One, we're beyond that, as everyone on the panel said. I mean, mm -hmm. we basically have that clear statement that verifiable national actions will be part of this, and we have the track record I presented in terms of what China, India, Brazil, Mexico have already done. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in terms of the EU, they did make significant reductions, and they're now prepared to participate in that larger effort that will go forward in terms of the, with the developing countries. So I think we're going to see a significant package coming mm -hmm. forward. So we're beyond sort of the history of did we do the right thing on Kyoto or not. We've now stepped up to the oh. point where everybody's oh. going to take real steps. You know, unfortunately, Mr. Markey and I couldn't go to Bali because we were busy doing the job we were elected to do uh, here. But uh, reading uh, the quotes in the press, particularly from Minister Gabriel, did not give me much heart that the EU had gotten the message, and particularly the largest economy within the EU, EU which is that of Germany. Uh, could I, could I uh, uh, reply to your question, Mr. Sensenbrenner? I, I think um, we really can't expect much more from the European Union than demagoguery, because that's really all they've got. Um, <laughs> they, they are not willing to take the actions that they committed to to reduce their emissions. And as you notice, uh, have already noted, they, their emissions went down after, between 1990 and 1997 for reasons that had nothing to do with emissions reductions. And so um, I think what, what, we, what we can hope for in future negotiations is that the U.S., together with Japan, Canada, and several other leading nations, will be able to lead this, these negotiations out of the Kyoto dead end. And uh, as long as the EU is, is unwilling to match its actions to its rhetoric, I think they will become more and more marginalized in this in this uh, the, facts simply don't, Mr. Sensen, the facts I mean, simply don't bear out what well, Mr. Ebel is saying. I Mr. Sensen, now, now, David, now, here, I have to submit to the record. It Mr. Shows Helm, each what's left, Mr. Helm, is my time. 
And I will just say that the two factors that allowed the EU to reduce their admissions from 1990 to 1997 were the fact that Mrs. Thatcher decided to put the British Coal Miners Union out of business and change electric generating uh, in the UK from coal to natural gas, and the uh, merger of East Germany and West Germany, and the uh, closing of the Stalin-era East German industries, which belched hot air and greenhouse gases and were environmental disasters and workplace safety disasters. That had nothing to do with compliance with the Rio Treaty. My time is up. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I would uh, invite <laughs> any of our other panel members who would like to submit for the record their view of reality in this regard. And I would just uh, begin by saying how much I appreciated the testimony that has been presented. Uh, because in, in the written form, it really is uh, they are terrific documents dealing with the broader context and uh, the reference that we are really sort of moving beyond Kyoto. We are moving to a new era. The rest of the world is moving in an exciting direction. And I, I really appreciate the context that you have provided. I think this ought to be required reading for everybody in Congress. I think it would be extraordinarily helpful. But I do it, 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 uh, invite you to supplement your submission. Uh, part of what is uh, interesting for me is um, that the United States, under a Republican administration, made some commitments. Made commitments. This didn't pop out of uh, the uh, Clinton administration or other fuzzy-headed people. This was uh, the result of negotiations where the United States was a partner. And the United States turned its back on implementation uh, and, in fact, resisted that. But I, we ought to go, let's go back to where that was in 1992. It is not that it is impossible. And you have documented some of the area. I, mean, I come from a city that is at 1990 level of emissions um, and has had four consecutive years of, um, and I appreciate, Mr. Abel, that is on the other side of the mountains, uh, but it is doing something that has actually helped that community and it has met those commitments. Careful now, uh, the other side of the mountain thing. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> just referring back to his testimony, mm -hmm. just his testimony, Greg. Um, I am uh, intrigued, however, um, about where we go from here. Um, I have been in a number of international meetings where the United States has been dragging its feet, not because it is going to get sued, but because it would be held accountable. I mean, think about our failure to meet our commitments in terms of international uh, global water and sanitation, where we were uh, in uh, Johannesburg, we were a retarding influence, not because we would be sued, but because we would have to perform. I am um, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, if, as we are moving into this next year, where it is an election year, where we have greater consensus around the world, where the people who have been dragging their feet, both in the developing and the developed world, are sort of launching ahead, I am wondering if our panel has some uh, suggestions or recommendations of what we might do in that next step, Mr. Chairman, uh, as we plot uh, things that might find their way into law and help frame uh, the next step. Just briefly have our friends respond. Let me, let me start because I think the, uh, the agreement reached in Bali does create a place for that conversation. The United States is neither fish nor fowl. We haven't ratified Kyoto, so we haven't participated in the discussion since Montreal in the last two years, the working group there about mitigation potential, cost effectiveness, what we can do vis-a-vis -vis other industrialized countries. And of course, we're not a developing country, so it's not appropriate for us to try to put ourselves in the same box within the convention. We have an agreement now creating a space for developed non-Kyoto countries like the U.S. to put on the table what they can do, to have civil society come in and talk about analysis that's been done in the United States about the cost effective mitigation potential, to have others put forward their information about that. This next year is really an, an analytical and, and research, get the facts right year to prepare for the serious hard bargaining in 2009. And there is a space there for Congress, for civil society, for our national labs, for NGOs to put forward the facts as we see them about how much the U.S. can do. 
Uh, Mr. Blumenauer, I would really encourage mem the members of this committee, as I have um, many members of the Senate, to become personally involved in these negotiations because we're going to find ourselves in a position, regardless of uh, what the Congress does next year in terms of debating legislation, where it's extremely likely that we will be in the middle, in the winding up of major negotiations concluding in a treaty at the same time that Congress is seriously moving forward on the first legislation that will bind the United States to emissions reduction. So the two debates are going to affect each other. And I think it's rather incumbent upon members of the Congress to begin talking to um, a number of foreign governments and really familiarizing themselves with this position because the two debates are going to collide. Um, I want to go back uh, for a moment to what Mr. Sensenbrenner was asking. Um, Regardless of what one wants to say about the European Union and the effectiveness of the measures it's taking, according to our own Department of Energy, Europe's projected emissions increases between now and 2030 are 0.3 percent per year. Japan's will be 0.1 percent per year. That is one-third and one-tenth of projected U.S. increased emissions. So there has been a significant, for whatever reason, and there are, you know, policy reasons for it, Europe and Japan are actually making major progress in improving their emissions, whereas the United States, to go back to Myron's comment, is in currently in violation of its treaty obligations under the Framework Convention of climate on Climate Change, and we're 18 percent above our well, 19 I'm, I'm happy to have given a, 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 the remainder of my time to the answer to Mr. Sensenbrenner's so question. My about, my had, about. No, no, no. Had I had time, Mr. Chairman, uh, one area that I happen to agree with Mr. Abel, and I think my colleague from Oregon, uh, Mr. Walden, would concur that there is a huge role in terms of worldwide practice of forestry, what happens in this country. Uh, I'm going to be lobbying you. Uh, we have some legislation pending on illegal logging. But there are a range of things. This might be something that might be worthy of a, of a hearing in the future where we could, I think, make some real progress. Great. Thank you, sir. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. And uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner is a formidable proponent. Of this, uh, so I think, I think this is very helpful for everybody to, to have a chance to come back at Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, could, I, could I add a, a reaction and then on I, that? I, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got some facts uh, I'd like uh, to put but up I think I think other members will give you that opportunity. The chair <laughs> recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank our, our panelists for their testimony today. It's helpful to, to get your views on this topic. Um, I want to pick up on, uh, on a couple of points, one from my, my friend and colleague from Oregon, and ask you each to talk about what the United States could do domestically um, on forest practices on its own land that might assist in carbon sequestration or mitigating against uh, unnecessary release of carbon and other greenhouse gases, principally because the record wildfires we're seeing and given the Forest Service's analysis over the last decade of warming climate and its effect on forests with drought and bug infestation. And if you could keep your answers fairly brief because I've got another question. Is there anything specifically you or your organizations have relative to management changes you would recommend on federal forest lands? Uh, yes, indeed, uh, Mr. Walden. I, I grew up on a ranch uh, in Baker County, Oregon. We still own that ranch. It, it adjoins BLM and Forest Service land, so I have a great deal of practical experience of federal land management. And I would say the very most important thing you could do would be to privatize the national forests. The management of those forests is a disaster. It is a continuing disaster. They change management practices and philosophies, but the continuing uh, undercurrent is it's always a disaster right. and because they don't have the incentives to manage their land properly the way private owners do. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Helm, thank you, Mr. Ebel. Mr. Helm, do you have any comments? Uh, I think there's a, a very interesting provision in the Lieber Warner bill that would be attractive here. They, in the allocation of allowances, they provide some of the allowances to forestry and agriculture folks who make improvements, reforestation, afforestation, and so on. The idea here is it's not offsets. It's in addition to. So you have the basic cap, then you take some of the allowances out right. of the pool, sell them for the money, pay the money to farmers. So would that apply to uh, federal forest, forest lands? It, only uh, in holdings, so. not no. Yes, yeah, you know, I'm trying to get it. Private, private people. All right. Yeah. Ms. Figueres? Countries, but not with respect to the United States. I will hold off. All right. Mr. Clapp? I think that uh, Ned covered 
what I would have said. All right, Mr. Meyer. I can ask our uh, forestry experts to get a response for you for the record. It's not my area of expertise, but one of our scientists is the lead author of the IPCC's land use change in forestry That'd chapter. So I'll try to get something for you on that. I, I one one that. additional yeah. suggestion would be to keep a, in this debate internationally right. in Bali, we're looking at national baselines for performance sure. of forests across the board. We do that sort of informally in the U.S. It would be very useful to do that and sort of keep track of what are the net flows on these federal right. lands. Right, that would be helpful. Um, and certainly the work internationally on forestry I think is extraordinarily important. We all recognize the importance of healthy forests. It's sequestering carbon. Eradication of the forest doesn't help. And uh, certainly these fires we've seen in, in the West are, are a real problem. Um, I want to move to carbon sequestration technology. Uh, I was in Europe with the Energy Committee um, earlier this year. We were looking at different facilities. Could anybody talk to me about the status of existing technology to do both capture and compression and then sequestration? Is the technology available today? If I have a coal-fired plant, is there technology available to me today that will capture compress what you have to do and then sequester carbon? And if not, what's the timeline to get there? My sense is the answer is yes, that we've done this, we've done the different steps in carbon capture and sequestration at different points. We haven't done it in one integrated way. The oil industry has done this for years with oil refineries right. where they capture the carbon and of course then re-inject it for secondary and ter tertiary oil recovery. So I would argue the technology is there. We still have some questions about the cost. I mean, if you talk to Exxon, for example, some of the major oil companies, they feel they could do this. So they know how to they know how to capture it. And they they do it now in terms of secondary oil recovery. So I think it's there. It's a question of putting all the pieces together. It's not something the utility industry has done. It's something more the chemicals and the sure. uh, gas and the oil industry. But I, I'm trying to find out is because when we did CO or uh, uh, Sox and Ox, uh, uh, the the uh, acid rain to capture those those emissions, that technology I understand was available at the time that cap and trade was put in place. And I keep hearing that this technology for carbon capture, compression, sequestration is not perfected yet. Mr. Mr. Meyer? Yes, let me just build on what Ned said. I think the technology is available. It's a question of price. My understanding is it would add now somewhere of 60 to 70 percent to the price of a conventional coal plant to retrofit this technology on. And then when you're going up to scale to find the reservoirs to permanently sequester the carbon is a challenge that our agencies are working on. There's demonstration projects around the world. The goal, I think, of DOE is to try to get that increased cost down to maybe the 10 to 15 percent range so it's more viable economically. But even there, we're going to have to help countries like China and India cover that spread between conventional unconstrained coal and carbon capture and storage yeah, coal. Yeah, two questions on that point as a follow-up. Um, is the issue about where do you put this carbon, how do you keep it there, and what happens if it comes out? And, um, and, and the second is, have you cost out the additional price per megawatt hour, or kilowatt hour, whatever matrix you want, that this capture and sequestration will add to, uh, say, the average power bill. Mr. Meyer. Mr. Weldon, I think we're at the point where the real issue is demonstrating the cost at scale. Um, you have utilities in the United States, I mean, Jim Rogers of Duke Energy has said this publicly many times, that he simply cannot justify to his shareholders because there is no regulatory or legislative requirement in place the kind of investment that is necessary to do demonstration projects. And that's where we are at this point. It's the, it's so you're the, telling me that the technology, I could go out today if I owned that coal fire plant and that technology is available to me to put in my smokestack or carbon stack, whatever we call it now, and, and the technology is there to run a tube and put the carbon in the ground. No, what I said is that we need the demonstration projects that bring okay. it up to scale. So it's not available now. It is not available at a commercial scale now. You, you need incentives the incentives to make it go. You need All right, I could, could I, I'm trying to get just the first piece yes. here, which yeah. is, is it technologically ready? It, what's it take to get there and then at what cost? Maybe Mr. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Walden. I think uh, it, is, uh, uh, it's, it is ready in the sense if you're willing to spend a lot more money and you're willing to do it at a small scale. Uh, I think okay. that the uh, two things should be really kept in mind. One is the current technology only captures two-thirds of the carbon dioxide that's produced. Uh, okay. and Secondly, I think the real thing besides the technology is are the legal and political obstacles to transport and, and pressurized storage underground. I think those are 
huge. And we heard that in Europe, too, that you are, in effect, if carbon's a pollutant, you're putting a pollutant in the ground, and some laws may have to be changed here and elsewhere to deal with that yes. set of Is that that's, true? Is that that's true. And I'd add, in terms of Europe, Mr. Sensenbrenner's favorite topic, Europe is committed to building 10 to 12 of these demonstration plants by 2015. They will have in place next year a new framework for regulating this very question you're asking. They've got that. It'll be completed by the end of 2008 so that we can go forward with, with those plants. But I think what we need here is we need the same kind of commitment in terms of demonstration. We're still just trying to build one future gen. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen. Thank you to the panelists. <coughs> Gentlemen, time forward, has expired. And uh, I'll just make this point that uh, as uh, part of the legislation the President is signing, uh, energy that there is six billion dollars, six billion dollars worth of federal government loan guarantees for carbon capture and sequestration uh, in the legislation. So uh, we are also now moving much more aggressively on that path. The chair recognizes the gentleman. Personal privilege, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I am, I am concerned the, the lateness of the hour. Uh, people have missed lunch. I have an alternative energy source, um, a fruitcake that I make every oh, year. Great. And I was, uh, it may not be legal after the next round of uh, <laughs> environmental protection. Thank you. So I was just going to pass this Beautiful. down here uh, if there is no violent objection. And um, uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner is raising ethics questions, but yes. I think we will say that for the purposes of uh, Congressman, we can accept fruitcake from other uh, congressmen. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you, fruitcake, the ultimate renewable energy, I suppose. Uh, I want to ask Mr. Helm about to, to elaborate on the European experience of the carrots rather than the sticks on uh, imports from countries that don't have aggressive carbon measures. Could you tell us how mature those efforts are and what successes they may have had and what lessons we ought to learn? Okay, I'd be happy to. Uh, as I mentioned, the EU has this high-level group on competitiveness, energy security, and climate, and it's been meeting for two years, and I participated two weeks ago in this high-level conference, 500 executives there. They agreed on a path that would be to encourage key developing countries to work with them on setting carbon intensity goals for key competitive sectors, so cement, steel, uh, pulp and paper, oil refining, that sort of thing. And the idea here would be you would have a, you do a benchmarking, sort of say, what's the best practice technology today for a wet kiln cement plant? That's, that comes at some level of carbon per ton of cement produced. You'd ask the, the Chinese to look at that, figure out what that means in terms of the context of China, in terms of its cost picture. Could they do that at a, you know, with a payback, or is that going to cost them a fair amount? What, what's that look like? You'd then ask the Chinese to set a target, and the Chinese would be offered incentives in the form of technology finance to go a little further, to set a little tougher target. That would be their target. It would be a no-lose target. They would set that target as part of their commitment in this next period, 2012 to 2020. Uh, they would receive the financing as an initial incentive on the technology side. And then if they beat the target, they could sell credits into the international market. This is an idea that has been tested among developing countries shown a lot of interest in it because they are interested the same way. They are after improving the efficiency of these, of these sectors. So it has got an appeal on both sides. It moves you toward that level playing field so that all of us would have a similar kind of commitment to technology and we take this carbon issue off the table. It doesn't take labor costs off the table, but it takes the carbon issue and the technology issue off the table and it gets the new technology in the hands. If you talk to China, what do they want from this treaty? They want the most advanced technologies and this is a way to offer that to them. And that's what the EU sees this as a very promising incentive path which gets the same place I want to go. I want a level playing field in cement and steel so I don't lose market share based on carbon standards, and, and that's where we're headed. So a very promising opportunity, as opposed to I'm going to stick you with taxes or I'm going to make you buy allowances if you're uh, not doing as well as I'd like you to do in terms of your carbon program. So it's so a much you, more positive approach. You said if they met or exceeded these standards, they could sell credits into the system. Mm -hmm. Was there a cost if they did not meet these standards? No. There would be, there'd be an understanding. They get this financing for technology. They got to have a contract. They got to build the plants. They got to operate the plants. They can't just say, "Oh, thanks, we like the money, and it's very nice." It's it's a, a contractual arrangement between that country and and the Annex One countries who are off on the, the financing. And they could use that money for a variety of things. In China, we were in discussions yesterday in China about their 20 percent goal, and one of their difficulties is getting the provinces to meet those targets. They set the national goal; it's the law. But then they have to get this done at the, at the local level. So they are saying, well, could we use the money for tax credits? Could we use the money for uh, having the, the cement association in China 
work with its members to get compliance. And that's the kind of thing we're looking at. And there's a, a good opportunity of collaboration with the WBCSC, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and others. So, so it's a very promising opportunity. What is the best way to really delve into that proposal from Europe? I mean, has anybody got sort of a the master paper describing that? or I can certainly share with you. I think, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the U.S. is on this path. The Asia-Pacific Partnership is developing the very benchmark data. The trouble is the U.S. has no credibility because at the end of the day, they won't put any money on the table for incentives, and they won't take any targets. If they did, their good idea would get a lot of momentum. I mean, uh, I think Myron was saying there's some collaboration with China and India. There is. But the point is, where's the beef? Where's the incentive money? That's what's been lacking, and where's the action? Could you put up that uh, you had a graph showing relative improvements in CO2 between the U.S. under McCain-Lieberman and China's existing? Slide. Could yeah, here it is. Can you see it from back there? Um, the red is uh, China, Brazil, and Mexico. Uh, the blue is the European Union's 30 percent target that they've set for 2020. The gray on the left is Lieberman-Warner in 2015. And the green on the right is Lieberman Warner in 2020. So to give you a, a feel for uh, the targets. And these are reductions below business as usual, OK? Because remember, China is growing 100%. So this is their shaving the growth. These are not reductions from 1990 levels, anything like that. But it still shows you that. And this is laws on the books today. This isn't projections of what they might do some other time. This is laws on the books today if fully implemented, if they did 100 percent implementation, which is always tough in developing countries. So this, take this with a grain of salt. I mean, I haven't studied this, but it's actually what's interesting to me, if you look at that graph, is even if we adopt McCain-Lieberman, even if it was implemented, we're still just marginally ahead of, of the amount we would be reducing compared to China, even if we adopt a cap-and-trade system, relative to their measures already. That's exactly right. And China's numbers for 2010, McCain and Lee Warner is 2020. So they're doing this faster by 10 years, which is what we need, actually. Now, is that a comment on, uh, and I support the cap-and-trade system, and my time is up. So I'll talk to you after this hearing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Time has expired. The chair recognizes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to also uh, just begin by saying God bless Mr. Blumenauer uh, for the spirit of giving. Thank you, sir. Um, the gentlewoman from Tennessee has left, and and and, uh, and I certainly will not be disrespectful. Uh, on a, on two occasions, she's used she's presented the word, the, the European scheme, as if it's something like the, the guy who uh, was able to drill underground in Texas when I was a kid to tap into other, uh, other oil. Uh, that, that was a scheme. Uh, in Europe, the, the word scheme is, the, the, the English word scheme is synonymous with the word plan, uh, diagram, uh, it, 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 it has nothing to do with some kind of system of ripping off folk. It, it means map. Uh, it means sketch. Um, and and I, it gives off the impression to, to, to some that, you know, that, the, that, that the, uh, the Europeans are announcing we're ripping you off. I mean, and, uh, and if they were doing that, they'd use another word. Uh, but uh, so I... I uh, that's that. She's done that twice, and I just wanted to say that. Um, the uh, the other thing, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ebel, uh, uh, I wasn't sure if you were serious when you were saying that the forest should be operated privately. Or I mean, you, were you making a point, or do you actually? I mean, do you, uh, Mr. Cleaver? Absolutely. Um, Federal land managers do not have the correct incentives to take care of what they are managing because they don't own it. So, yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> uh, the the uh, developing nations and the uh, poor nations, uh, Ms. Figueres, Rias, uh, uh, are especially vulnerable uh, to climate change, particularly uh, concerning floods and, and droughts and other disasters. 
And uh, these nations, like uh, many of those in sub-Saharan uh, Africa uh, and Southeast Asia, are least responsible for the effects of uh, global warming. And uh, what can the nations of the world, like the United States, like the EU, uh, assist uh, uh, some of the poorer countries, uh, third world countries, uh, in, 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 in uh, uh, attaining the, the technologies uh, to, to compensate for the effects of, of global warming? I'm not, I, I, Costa Rica probably is not necessarily in that category, but certainly Southeast Asia and Africa, uh, African nations are. Yes, exactly. Southeast Asia, Africa, all the small island states um, and the low-lying, least developed countries are all in that situation. And this is, in fact, one of the major inequities of climate change. Um, that the fact, as you say, that all of these countries are the major victims without having contributed to the problem in the past, or in fact in the future, most of these countries. What the United States could do very concretely is contribute to the various instruments that are being developed. One of the issues in the Bali decision, one of the um, chapters, is adaptation. Um, and there are very concrete measures there as to what all countries could do together in order to support particularly those countries that will need to adapt and that actually urgently need to adapt before they completely disappear like the small island developing states. Um, in addition to contributions to the adaptation fund, there is finally some decision on the governance of the adaptation fund um, and that also would require a very clear leadership of the United States both in terms of financing as well as in, in terms of ascribing um, where funds would go to. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Meyer. Just come in on that, uh, Congressman. The, the thing to get clear here is the scale of the need. The World Bank estimates that we need $40 billion to $50 billion a year. Oxfam estimates $50 to $80 billion a year as a starting point to build capacity in these countries to deal with adaptation to climate change. We are putting two orders of magnitude less a year on the table, hundreds of millions, not tens of billions. The other point I would make is, is that we have to do aggressive mitigation if we want to make adaptation even feasible. We did analysis, for example, for our own state of California here, for Governor Davis and Governor Schwarzenegger, which showed if you had an aggressive mitigation path in California and the world, you would lose about half of the Sierra snowpack by 2090. If you had business as usual growth, you would lose virtually all of the Sierra snowpack by the middle of the century, and that is the drinking water supply for California. That is the Central Valley irrigation. That is when Governor Davis and Governor Schwarzenegger got it. This is a core economic issue. So to have adaptation be feasible and even on the bounds of being affordable, you have to have the most aggressive mitigation scenario you can have. And even with that, we are going to have some impacts that we are experiencing now. They are going to get worse over the next 20 or 30 years. That It is our moral responsibility to help these countries who had no role in creating this problem deal with the consequences of our past behavior. I could just add half a sentence to that. Um, yes, it is the moral responsibility, and it is not just a moral responsibility. Actually, from the point of view of the United States, this is a long-term security issue for the United States. If you think that we are having a hard time now dealing with the immigration issue in the United States, that is nothing compared to the climate immigration waves that we will have unless we help these countries deal with the situation on their own territory. Just add one more comment to that. Um, the nation projected to be the most rapidly impacted in terms of loss of water supplies worldwide is actually not in Africa. It is Mexico. So the question of immigration that Ms. Figueres, Figueres just raised is a very serious one. Um, in addition, um, this actually has implications for the targets, the worldwide reduction targets that were on the table in Bali. Those are actually projected, no matter how aggressive they may seem in our context, to provide us with only a 50 percent chance of avoiding the worst impacts of climate change. So the measures in Bali were not by any means extreme. They were inadequate to guarantee that we would not suffer the worst impacts. Thank you. I don't know how much time I have left. I don't have any time left. Five seconds. If you Five seconds. Mr. Ebel, you, 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 do you really, I mean, General, the General Motors National Park. I mean, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I do not uh, support the privatization of the national parks. But in terms of, of managing our national forests, they, they are and they have been for a long time a disaster. And it's because <coughs> People who don't own things don't have the incentive to take care of them. They have the incentive to use them up. 
And therefore, I, I really think that the best thing we could do in terms of adopting the good kinds of forestry practices that Mr. Walden has been an advocate of would be to privatize the national forests. Uh, they wouldn't end up in General Motors' hands. They, a lot of them would probably end up in Ted Turner's hands. So, and you can have I, either good or bad feelings about that. I don't know. Okay, Enron uh, National Park. Okay. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, New York State, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, and thank you all uh, for your testimony. I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Meyer uh, regarding that worst-case scenario, which uh, uh, Bali gives us a 50 percent chance if we uh, manage to put this agreement together of avoiding. Um, what is your organization projecting as uh, likely sea level rise uh, should we hit that worst case scenario? Well, it is not what my organization is projecting. It is what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is projecting, and that has been certified by all governments of the world and reviewed line by line. There is a couple of stories there. One, there is the sea level rise we are going to see from thermal expansion, glaciers melting, that kind of thing, which is somewhere in the, the one to three feet range by the end of the century. What is really not on the table, though, is the more rapid uh, concern about disintegration of the Greenland ice sheet, the Antarctic ice sheet, some of the new science that is coming out about the flow rates there and the water going down and lubricating the flow of those glaciers. I would encourage you to have a hearing with some of the top experts on that in the world because there is a lot of concern in the science community that there may be more on the table there than was captured in the recent IPCC report, which had a close-off date at the end of 2005 for the peer-reviewed literature that could, it could take into consideration in its findings. This is of great concern uh, to the scientists that study uh, the ice sheet modeling and the ice sheet flows, and I would encourage you to have a separate uh, hearing just on that issue. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, I represent a district which is divided by the Hudson River, uh, which is tidal all the way to Troy, uh, past Albany. And, of course, any increase in sea level will also be an increase in river level, which will be then added to by tidal changes and storm uh, waves and surge and so on. Uh, so it, it does affect us directly, uh, including those communities uh, like Beacon and Newburgh and Kingston and uh, uh, others that have newly refurbished their waterfronts with uh, uh, restaurants and stores and promenades and, uh, you know, not to mention the, the uh, commercial rail running up uh, just above river level on the west bank of the Hudson and the uh, Amtrak uh, and MTA commuter line that runs uh, with passengers carrying passengers up the east bank uh, just above the water level of the Hudson currently. Um, I'm curious. Uh, given the fact that the executive branch tends to be the face of our nation uh, to, to many around the world. Uh, we in Congress are trying, as you know, to um, change energy policy, and we were just successful in getting a, a decent energy bill. It wasn't perfect, but then no legislation is, I suppose. Um, we hope that this will show the world that we are serious or we are getting serious on this issue. What else would you recommend that Congress do to send this message uh, to other countries around the world? Well, I, th I think as my colleague uh, Phil Clapp said, uh, participate in this process uh, as part of the U.S. delegation. Talk to the delegates about what's going on. I was amazed how very aware they are of the actions of this Congress. They knew when the energy bill was coming to the floor. I got emails the day after the committee reported out the Lieberman-Warner bill uh, by an 11-8 vote from Japan, from Europe, from developing countries congratulating the United States for the work that that committee had done. They follow our politics very closely because, uh, as Christiana said, they realize they are in our hands. What we do is going to matter to their future. And uh, I think participating in this process, uh, going over to meet with them at these meetings or on your own, uh, inviting them to come and testify to you and meet with you here, the exchange of views between the rest of the world and civil society and the other branches of government in the United States is a key issue and I think will improve their confidence in going forward in the next two years in this process. Um, I, I'm just going to jump ahead because uh, my time is limited, as is all of our time. Um, I'm happy to see one of the key topics in Bali is technology transfer and that um, helping developing countries to leapfrog over fossil fueled power development is on the map. America has the technological know-how and resources to bring many of these technologies uh, into play uh, to help developing countries uh, jump into a clean energy future. Uh, Perhaps uh, Ms. Figueres and uh, uh, Mr. Helm could comment on what steps our government should be taking to aid the process of technology transfer, uh, which would also make 
us an energy and technology exporter as opposed to the fuel importer that we are, are mostly now. As I mentioned, I think there is a great deal of interest in sharing technology, particularly in these internationally competitive industries. And so I think the U.S. joining in this effort with Europe and others to provide assistance directly for innovation and linking it to uh, developing countries taking more aggressive targets. I mean, the theory from Bali is developing countries are doing a lot, as I showed you. They will do more if there is assistance for technology, for sectoral activity in terms of these key industrial sectors, for reductions from deforestation. So I think there is a big opportunity here for us to put something on the table and, and, and draw forward. And I think one of the ways to do it is to take a portion of the allowances. We are seeing this. Norway is doing it. Germany is doing it. They are basically taking allowances out of their system, auctioning those and using the money as incentive money to help developing countries move forward and get more reductions. Uh, to complement that, on the private sector side, the studies that have been done on financial flows that are necessary in order to address climate change show that more than half, in fact, above 60 percent of the financial flows will be coming from the private sector um, as opposed from the, from the public sector. And so in that sense, once a policy both nationally and internationally is in place, that will be enough to signal to the markets and to signal to the private sector that then they can go ahead and make the investments and those investments will then transfer into, translate into being the technology transfer that developing countries need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, <clears throat> let's do this. Um, we will give each one of you one minute to summarize what you want us to remember. The energy bill is done. Bali is completed. Uh, climate change, cap and auction and trade is now front and center in the United States House of Representatives and Senate uh, next year. What do you want us to remember uh, from this hearing as we go forward? Uh, and begin this uh, great uh, project that is about to be undertaken. We will go in reverse order and we will begin with you, Mr. Ebel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would urge you to keep, uh, as you consider energy rationing policies, to keep in mind the energy needs not only of this country but of the world. Um, and I would just uh, make this uh, particular observation that uh, Mr. Hall said earlier uh, he encouraged people to adopt a polar bear. I think that's great. Uh, my, my colleague who is here today in, in the audience, William Yateman, uh, was a, a Peace Corps volunteer in, in Kyrgyzstan. And uh, he will, uh, for, uh, if, if you want to contribute $50 to buy a ton of coal to keep a Kyrgyz family warm during this very cold winter in Kyrgyzstan, he will be happy to arrange that for you. Those are the real energy realities of the world. There are a lot of people who do not have enough energy to live the kinds of lives that we lead. Um, and I would, I would just, just think back uh, uh, to another great uh, member of, from Massachusetts, John Adams. When he was elected to the Continental Congress, he was a leading citizen of Boston, but he, he had to walk to Philadelphia. That is still the reality for a lot of the world. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Ebel. Uh, Mr. Helm. Number one, I would say moving legislation at least as strong as Lieberman Warner is the most important thing you could possibly do. We need that kind of a target. Secondly, on this competitiveness issue, I think uh, we need to recognize there is a place for incentives. We need to recognize that it is a, it's a myth that developing countries are going to steal market share based on carbon. China is already acting in cement, steel, pelt and paper and so on, and they are going to be better, more efficient than we are by the time 2020 rolls around. So that is not the issue. The issue is working together to get that level playing field. And finally, on the EU, I want to submit for the record, only two countries of the 15 are not meeting their targets on their own. Only Spain and, Gr and Italy are not. And the, I give you a chapter and verse about why the EU program is, the new program is very aggressive and they are meeting it. The, the trading system works. Ms. Figueres. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good news and bad news. The good news is that the new engagement of the developing countries actually opens up an unprecedented opportunity to rethink the structure, the logic and the potential of the future chapter of the climate change regime. The bad news is that we need to do this overnight. We are under an incredible tight time frame. 
we cannot afford to fail on this opportunity that is laid before us over the next two years. If within two years, at the end of 2009, we don't have a global agreement that aggressively moves us forward, we will not be able to face our children and grandchildren. Uh, Mr. Clapp. Uh, similar to what Ms. Fierres just said, this is our last agreement. This is our last shot. Um, we have to have a, an international agreement that stops the growth of emissions and begins a pathway downward by 2020. If we don't get that agreement now, we will have missed the opportunity to get industry moving in that direction. So the catastrophic impacts will occur. Um, the second is that I would hope that many of you would have the political courage to not become part of the Bash China movement. Uh, China has been rather aggressive uh, in its energy policies domestically, as we've heard today, and it is a, it is a country very different from the United States. China's uh, coastal population in the cities makes a, has an a, a per capita income of about $1,200 a year. 57 percent of its population still lives on less than $5 a year, whereas the United States per capita income is $42,000 a year. Um, our standing to lecture what is still one of the poorest countries in the world is rather th slim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clapp. Um, Mr. Meyer. Yes, three points. I think the message from Bali is clear. It is time for the United States not just to talk the talk, but walk the walk. Uh, if we continue to put a price of exactly zero on carbon pollution of the atmosphere, we are not going to be taken seriously in this process. So the more you can do to move domestic cap and trade legislation through the process to signal that the U.S. is going to get on board with the rest of the world, the better our chances will be in the negotiation. Second, this is not just a risk, it is an opportunity. Keep your focus on the clean energy jobs that can be created, the new markets that can be created in helping the world solve this problem. I know Congressman Inslee has put forward some very bold ideas there. We need an Apollo revolution in this country. And there is an upside for dealing with this problem, not just a downside. And the third is that, well, the costs of achieving the deep cuts that we are talking about by 2050 are not zero. They are not minimal. They are affordable. Uh, they are somewhere in the range of half to 1 percent of gross domestic output by the middle of the century. Uh, that is the equivalent of postponing, tripling world output from 2050 to 2051. I think our descendants would say that is a pretty good deal. On the other side, the costs of doing something are far, cost, far lower than the costs of doing nothing. There is no scenario feasible where we can do nothing and have nothing happen in return. And estimates vary on, on what the ratio is there, but there is very little disagreement that the costs of inaction are much greater than the costs of dealing with this problem. We thank you. We thank uh, each of the witnesses. This has been absolutely a um, fantastic uh, panel. And, uh, and we thank uh, each of you for uh, giving us this uh, preview of coming attractions in the United States Congress for the next one year. I think uh, global warming is about to be injected into uh, uh, the politics of the United States in a way that uh, will uh, match a few others for the next one year. Uh, and your, with your help, we have begun that today. Thank you so much. There is one more piece of fruitcake. <laughs>